and welcome to United Church Online. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. If you are new to United Church, why don't you fill in the Connect card in the description or visit our website for more information. So let's ready our Bibles, notebooks and pens as we get ready to receive the Word together. This morning, the title of my sermon is Finding Peace in the Silly Season. Because how many of you know this is indeed the silly season? When December comes, it's a whole different vibe. It's just, I don't know, some people go home. How many of you are going home for December? Wherever home is, okay. How many of you enjoy going home, like you look forward to it? Okay, like two people. And the rest of you, you're going home, but you don't actually look forward to it. You're just like, oh, Jesus, give me strength, you know? Um, I was listening to radio this week, and one lady called in. And she was like, you know, December comes and she actually, she hates it because the stress of thinking about going home, you know, many people obviously end up going and she's like, I don't like it because it's a lot of anxiety. It's a lot of stress. Not only that, the expectations you have to deal with, because when you go home, the people at home think you earn a lot more than you actually earn. So when you get home, it's like everything is on you. You sponsoring the Christmas lunch, you sponsoring the drinks. Everyone's like, yeah, the big city person is here. Come, you buy it. And you're like, no, no. No, 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 no. That's not how this works. And so people were calling in and they were actually saying, you know what? December is actually more stressed than any other month, you know? It's like, you have to do that. Matt's, when is the bonus coming in? When is the debit orders coming in? You know, some people are like, I just want to stay at home. In fact, I remember when I was young, around the 16th-ish, everybody closed. I don't know if you remember back in the day, like everybody closed on the 16th. And then from there until January, everybody was, but now... Most people are working, some people are working extra hours in December to make up extra money. It feels like it's more stress in this season than any other time. Does anybody relate? It's just like it's busier. How, how many of you are going away, like, like, like holiday, not family? I mean like going away on holiday. I, I, I don't know why, but for some reason, um, this is how, I think it's a spiritual principle. This is how God just tricks people. Like there's one, if, if, you, if you're married, there's one person who loves packing the bags way before the time. (laughs) Like if you're leaving on the 16th, they done packing on the 1st of December, right? (laughs) And then you have the other person that you're married to that packs the day you're leaving. Like they never knew you were going on holiday, right? So I am that person. The morning we leave is the morning I pack. As long as there's underwear, I'm happy. Everything else, (laughs) we don't wear shirts on the beach anyway, so we don't need those, you know? So my wife is the person that like she packs in January for a trip in December. She's like, because this, it's it's, it's anxiety inducing. How many of you know, like when preparing for something gives a bit of stress and anxiety. If you are those people, you know, it's not just, you know, oh, we're going on holidays. What do we need to pack? How long are we going to be there? We're going away. And so my wife is like, it's a 17 hour drive. What are we going to entertain the kids with? What are they going to eat? It's not just, I'm like, I'm driving. It doesn't matter, you know? So it's like, for many people, this season brings a bit of anxiety. So even though, let's be honest, this is meant to be a season of peace. I mean, it was prophesied of Jesus around his birth. He would be the prince of peace, peace right? One of the four weeks of Advent, love, joy, peace. But for us, it's like, it's anything but peace. At least it doesn't feel like it, right? Because of all that it comes with. For many people, it's the rush of it. You know, you need a holiday after your holiday. Many of you need a holiday after you come from your family. It's just, Jesus, I need, I need to be saved again after leaving my family's house. Because we all know there's always that uncle that says stuff he shouldn't say or that aunt that says inappropriate things. If you don't have one of those, it's because you might be that uncle or that aunt. <laughs> you are that person and you just don't know it yet. <laughs> Along with that, let's be honest, for many of us, the reason why this is such a difficult thing to wrap our heads around is because many of us have a warped perspective of what peace really means, right? You've got a certain image of what peace is. Let's be honest, in your mind, peace looks a certain way. I just want to do a, a bit of a test. In you, like, and I'm, This is a question answer. What is your perspective of a peaceful situation? Give me, I'm looking for actual answers. In your mind, when you think peace, what pops into your head? Who said, what did you say? Quiet. (laughs) Okay. So in your mind, if it's like peaceful, no one talks to you. It's just you in your room by yourself. Okay. Okay. How many of you relate? It's just there needs to be quiet. Okay. 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 Anyone else? Who said, someone said, hey? Bali. Yo, 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 yo. 
we clearly are not on the same page here. Like, <laughs> I'm like somewhere in the Val at least. You know why? Because I'm a Vali. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so for you, travel, Bali, like that, in your mind, that's peace. Okay, anyone else? Yes? Calmness. Calmness. Okay, so you like, you need that music in the background. <laughs> you know, like when you go to a spa, it's like. Okay, so calmness. All right. I, I think that's part of the challenge is that in our minds, peace only looks a certain way, right? And so if there's going to be peace, there needs to be calmness. There needs to be quiet. It has to be in Bali, apparently. <laughs> it's like. There has to be water. For some of you, as long as I can hear the beach from where I'm staying, immediately peaceful, you know? It's like, it doesn't matter. Even when you're having a fight, we're having a very peaceful fight <laughs> because I can hear the ocean, you know? For some of you, anywhere where your kids are not there, that's peaceful. <laughs> Amen, parents. Oh, so it's not just me, okay. <laughs> so because we've got a warped perspective of what peace looks like, we struggle to maintain it because when we're not in that specific space, if there's no water, if it's not peace and quiet, if there's no calmness or whatever it is, we believe or falsely believe that we cannot find peace, right? And so for many of us, it's like, I'll only find peace when I go to that place or when I'm with that people or in that situation. But have a look at what Jesus says in John chapter 33. He wraps this idea of peace around us. He says, I have told you these things, so that in me, you would have perfect peace. In this world, you will have tribulation and distress and suffering, but be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished and my victory is abiding. And so what Jesus points us to is that anywhere where he is, that's where peace can be found. So peace is not a place, it's not away from specific people, it's not only a certain situation. He says, peace is found in me. So wherever you go, as long as you have the presence of Jesus, there is access to perfect peace. And this is such good news for many of us who happen to be in certain situations or around certain people or if we're going away, because we realize that peace is not unattainable only in certain situations, that really peace is an inside job that we can happen to find peace because only Jesus gives us a peace like no other. Yeah. And so in as much as you want to travel, go to the beach or whatever it is, those things are good. They are peaceful, but those things are not the source of peace. And this is why so many people wrestle with this because we falsely equate peaceful things with peace. And so what happens is, you know, I'll go away, I'll go to the beach, I'll go on holiday, I'll go into the space of calmness, but it will only keep me peaceful for a little while, but it does not give me peace. Why? It is not the source of peace. Jesus is the source of peace. And so what Jesus points us to is that we need to be rooted in him because when he is at the center, it doesn't matter where I am. Maybe I am with the family that frustrate me, but I can be there and still have peace. Because my peace is not determined by anything external. My peace is internal. If we don't believe this, what ends up happening is our culture will send us running back and forth trying to find peace. Some people will tell you, I mean, if you Google it, I, I, did, the, I did myself the disservice of Googling how to find peace. Many people will say, you know what, you need to distance yourself from negative people. I mean, who, who agrees with that? This is like, please. And for some of you, you know, that's not possible because how do you, how, how do you distance yourself from your wife? Let's be honest. I just, not, that's not me. I'm just saying for some people, for some people. <laughs> so like, pastor, I want to distance myself, but they live with me. <laughs> You know, some things will say, distance yourself from negative people. It sounds like a great idea. Some will say, practice mindful meditation, you know, and that sounds good until you realize in that moment, you've got a baby crying in the background, your kid, daddy, 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 daddy. It's like, it's, it's not going to happen. Some people say, focus on inner peace or your inner voice. I'm like, my inner voice is a colored accent. There's nothing peaceful about it. It's like, it's loud. It's giving me instructions. <sighs> Some people will say connect with nature, right? 
And you can only do that for so long before it starts to rain in December and then your peace is gone. So it will send you running back and forth to search for peace, but we know those things don't give peace. They might be peaceful, but they don't give peace. And so we end up struggling because what most authors and bloggers and secular psychologists and influencers don't realize is that all the things they give us to do is simply methodology. It is things to do, but they give a methodology without giving us substance. So what they'll say is, if you want to find peace, do this, do this, do this, do this. But all of those are just things. They aren't the source of peace. And so we end up doing these things over and over and over again. And hence we kind of fit, you know, maybe I need to do it more. Maybe I need to try something different because all of those things we do don't have substance. So they'll say, practice mindful meditation. Sounds great, but meditate on what? They don't tell you what to meditate on. Just meditate on what? On nothing. No, no, no. There needs to be something I am meditating on. There needs to be substance. They'll say, clear your mind, right? Don't, don't think about this. I can't just clear my mind. We can't just do that. How many of you try to not think of something? In fact, on the count of three, try to not think of anything. One, two, three. What happens? You think about not thinking. <laughs> You're not not thinking, right? That's not the goal. The goal is replace this thought with a better one. That's maybe a better approach. They'll say things like, you know what, escapism, you know, if you refrain from certain spaces, places, and things, all that is is escapism. I'm escaping the situation. Guess what? I'm going to come back to it. And what, what happens to my peace then? It's like, you know, if you just get out of that environment, you'll find peace. And then when I go back to work on Monday morning, work is still there. And that same manager is there, along with all of those colleagues, back there. Peace, gone. Dololo, peace. You know? <laughs> Some people will say things like minimalism. You know, cut these things out of your life. If you just, the more you cut out of your life, the more peace you'll find. But let's be honest, for some of us, that can only work up until a certain point, And then... You can't find peace in just saying goodbye to certain things. So we need to go to scripture to find out, God, if I want to find true peace, I can't do it the way the culture dictates. Because yeah. the culture will have me running back and forth. However, the pathway to the peace that Jesus gives is different. It's not like culture. Jesus doesn't just give us things to do. He gives us himself. John 14 verse 1 says this, don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God and trust also in me. So when our trust is in him, he gives us what no one else and nothing else can give us. And so if we're going to run and search for peace, we need to run to him first. I love what Timothy Keller says um, when he speaks on peace. He writes this in a book called um, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And the context there is peace. He says, the peace of God is not the absence of some thoughts, but the presence of God himself. So it doesn't matter where I am. If God is there with me, that's where peace can be found. Because God's presence is what brings peace. So how then do we go on this journey of accessing God's peace, not the culture's peace, not the psychologist's peace, not the influencer's peace, but the peace that only God can give. Paul gives us an idea as he writes. One of the um, biblical authors, Paul, writes to the Philippian church, and he writes on finding peace. And have a look at what he says, Philippians from chapter 4. And I mean, this is so short and so simple. We'll finish the sermon afterwards. He says this, don't worry about anything. Done. It's been a good sermon. Father God, we pray this morning. <laughs> if only it were that easy, isn't it? If only it was just like, don't worry about anything. If you want to find peace, don't worry. Done. Leave. No. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So according to Paul, one of the first ways that you and I can walk towards peace starts with our connection with God. Because that's what prayer is. For people who see prayer as transactional, it's difficult to access God's peace because they're not connecting with God, they're simply transacting. Yeah. I come to God, I give him the list of things I want, I ask him for the list of blessings I want, and I'm done. But Paul says that's not really what prayer is meant to be. Prayer is meant to be a time when we come before God, we connect our heart to God's heart. What happens? I give him my anxiety, all the things that are causing me to be anxious or stressed or whatever it is, I can lay that down before him. So God, I'm in this situation. 
And I just like to lay this before you. I mean, this work situation, relational situation, family situation, whatever it is, whatever is drawing from our inner peace, God, I'm laying that before you. And not only do I give him my heart, I receive from his. So God, I want you this morning to give me your peace, give me your calm, give me your spirit, give me of yourself. So in that moment, we are connecting our hearts to the hearts of God. Without that communion and connection, prayer will only ever be transactional. I come I make my list, I give him my list of blessings, and I leave, and I'm done. But that's not what it is. So Paul starts there, he says, if we're going to journey towards peace, it starts prayerfully. There has to be a connection between us and God. There's no ways we can get the God of peace without God himself, right? Many of us want peace, but we don't want God, we just want his peace. You have to get him to get what he has to offer, right? He continues, Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he has done. Look at the cause and effect. Tell him what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Then, so once you've done this, there's a cause and effect. Then you will experience God's peace. Not culture's peace, not the world's peace. A peace that only comes from our communion with God. His peace is different to every other. And for those of you who have experienced this, you know this. There are times when you have a sense of peace, even when everything outside of you says you shouldn't. Have you ever been in that situation? When everything around you is just going insane, but yet you have an inner peace that is unlike anything else. Maybe you might not even understand it or know it. You're just like, normally I would be stressed right now. Normally I would be anxious. Normally I would be freaking out. But for some reason, I'm okay. And to other people, it doesn't make sense. They're trying to put their anxiety on you and you just, why? It's because God is giving you that peace. And so Paul says, then you will experience the king of God. That, sorry, the, wow, the peace of God, which exceeds anything you can understand. This is not the kind of peace you can rationalize. This is not the kind of peace where it's, it's an equation. No, it comes from God himself. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. So when it says his peace will guard your hearts and minds, it's almost as if the peace that God gives forms a, a security barrier to your heart and your mind. That when there's anything externally that wants to make its way in, the peace of God stands outside and says, no, 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 you're not allowed in here. Anxious thoughts, external worries, external stresses, God's peace says, ah, ah, no, no. You don't have access here. You stay there. I'm protecting this. Which leads me to this idea that often, I mean, most of you have heard this word before, we often find ourselves in certain situations where we are triggered, right? Certain things trigger us. Certain people trigger us. Certain situations trigger us. It's like a trigger that goes off. And when I'm with that person or when I'm in that situation or with those people or with those family members, somehow someone says something and something in me just, mm, 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 mm. You've all been there. You've all been at that family gathering and there's that one uncle that's just, ooh, Jesus, help me. He's had a bit too much to drink. He's a bit too free with his opinions and he just brings the worst out of you, right? We've all got a colleague like that. And, and here's the thing. Normally, we blame the idea of being triggered on the other person. And so we say things like, that person brings out the worst in me or that person just steals my peace. They just rob my peace. Whenever I'm around them or whenever I'm around him or her, they just, they just bring something out of me. Can I, can I just point us to a different place? Maybe, maybe it's not them. Maybe they are helping us realize that we've got something internally that we haven't dealt with. Maybe the issue lies in here instead of out there. Because here's the trajectory. What culture says, if there's anyone that robs your peace, anyone that steals your peace, what do you do? You cut them off. Yes. Cut those people off. Cut that uncle off. Cut that family member off. Cut your colleagues off. What happens? We are essentially just making our world smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And we end up never really dealing with what is inside. And let's be honest, the cutting off process is the easy process. I just don't see them anymore. I delete their number. I just don't go to that person's house. I don't just go to that area. I stay away from that mall. And all that happens is my world becomes smaller, but I don't grow. Because I never really learn how to deal with what God wants me to deal with. 
But if the opposite is true, if I find myself triggered, I realize, ooh, that person said that and I felt a certain type of way about it. I can go to God and say, God, why did that bring out this response in me? Why did that make me angry or upset or furious or whatever it is? And God can begin to show you, oh, there's, there's something undealt with here. There's something inside of you. And when we lay it at his feet and he works on it, guess what? Later on, next time, next year, whatever, when that person says what they said, I can hear it without it triggering something in me. Yeah. Why? Because I've had to learn to deal with this and they just need to learn to deal with themselves. And so the idea of being triggered is more a reflection, less on the other person and more with the condition of my heart. And so next time you find yourself being triggered, ooh, that person triggers me. That should be a response. Oh, hang on, hang on. Why? They don't have the power to trigger me. There's something in here. They didn't steal my peace. I allowed them to. People can't steal things. We don't allow them to. And another way of saying it is this. The world cannot take something that it didn't give you. So we give, we give the world too much credit. This, this person, that, that, you know, that colleague, whatever, we give them so much credit because they stole it. No, no, they didn't steal it. You gave it up, right? People can't take stuff that we don't allow them to. They can't take it because they didn't give it to us. If God gives us peace, someone else can't take what God gave us, right? And so this is something worth thinking about. And so Paul mentions this. And so Paul says, God's peace will guard our hearts and minds. His peace will stand guard over us. And then he goes on to the next section. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. So he started with prayer, then he moves on. Fix your thoughts. So once we've worked in our connection with God, we've prayed, we've connected with him, we've laid these things down before him. Paul says the next step then is to watch what happens in here because what's in here will make its way to here. So he says, what we need to do is we need to fix our thoughts. Watch what you think about. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, right? So we need to be the ones to take stock of what happens in our minds. And that's another challenge for many people because what we don't realize is that I take myself everywhere I go. So I think peace is found in a situation, but here's the thing. If there's turmoil here and here, no matter what happens outside here, there will always be turmoil in here. Why? Because you're just taking this turmoil to the beach. And you're taking this turmoil to the mountains. And you're taking this turmoil to Bali. <laughs> you're just upset in a different location. <laughs> but you haven't dealt with what's happening in here and in here. But the opposite is true. If I've dealt with what happens in here and here, it doesn't matter what's happening around me. There will always be peace in here and in here, because my external circumstances do not affect what is happening in my heart and in my mind. So fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things. What we think about, what we entertain, the, the, the way we think is vital because what popular psychology or whatever will tell us is, you know what, empty out your thoughts. But in reality, it's not emptying out your thoughts, it's replacing them with something of deeper value, right? With thoughts that are more true and lovely and admirable, like Paul says. So it's not, don't think of anything, because we can't do that, it's thinking on the right things. What are those things? We need to be thinking on the promise of God, the character of God, and the word of God. That's what brings peace. Let me give you an example. So Shani and I, my wife, we... Um, we were going through a season of vision offering over the past month or two, and some of you might remember. And so we were busy chatting, and we we're like, you know, what should we be giving? Because we firmly believe in leading by example. We would never ask people to give anything that we ourselves haven't committed to. So we're going back and forth, and we're talking, and we realize that there's a lot of stuff happening in our lives. You know, we've got a lot happening. There's a renovation at our home. We've still got um, the hospital to pay off from the birth of our daughter. And so we end up coming up with an amount that's, that's fairly small and within reach, right? And then my wife goes and... She does a lot of amazing things, except when she does this. She, she, <laughs> she comes back and she's like, hey, um, I, don't think, I don't think that we did the right thing. I don't think we committed to giving the amount that will stretch us. We committed to giving what is within our reach. But we didn't stretch ourselves. That wasn't sacrificial giving. That was comfortable giving. And so we went back and forth and we spoke and we're like, okay, let's do this. Let's go and we fast and, and let's pray and let's just 
give what we feel God is leading us to, right? That's a better approach. So we went and we fasted and we prayed like good Christians should. And, and eventually we realized we were making a decision based on our limitations, not so much stretching ourselves. And then what happened was when we went through this process, we started thinking of every time God has been faithful to us. And we started thinking about times when God came through and we thought about times when God provided and we thought about previous situations like last year's vision offering and God provided the seed that we needed to sow. And suddenly we realized, no, 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 we can't shrink after God has stretched us. And the thing was this, is that it's not that we didn't think, it's just that we thought about the right things. We thought about God and how faithful he has been. We thought about his word and how God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? And how God says, I will give seed to the sower, right? And how God says, those who fear God will lack no good thing, right? And we began to reflect on his word and say, well, if you say this in your word, then we don't have to fear what happens. We can just act in obedience knowing that you've got this beyond our action. And we began to reflect on God's previous um, victories in our lives when he came through for us there and there and there and how he provided and how he sent the right people. And we just realized, hey man, God's got this. I believe it is Charles Stanley that says, obey God and leave the consequences to him. And so what happens after all of that, you know what, ha what happened? Is we found peace in being able to commit to giving what we felt we needed to give. That peace didn't come because we searched anywhere. That peace came because we fixed our thoughts and we thought about the right things. And this is true for you and I. Whenever we find ourselves in a situation that brings about tension or anxiety or stress, or whatever it is, how often do we go back and say, okay, God, this is what I'm really stressed about, but your word says, your word says that you will protect us. For those of you who find yourself stressing over safety, your word says that you will provide for us. For those who find themselves in a position of being anxious about provision, right? That whatever we stressed about, we can go back to God's word and begin to think about those things. Pondering on the thing we stressed about won't lead to peace. In fact, it will do the opposite. It will multiply our anxiety, right? And so Paul points us back. He says, okay, once you've prayed, something needs to happen in here where we fix our thoughts. So he goes, he goes think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you have received from me. So according to Paul, it starts with prayer. It starts with controlling our thoughts then there's an action that needs to happen. We put into practice this way of life. We begin to act out the things that we have been taught, which means that we don't, it's not just something outside of ourselves. We need to do the things that God calls us to do, put his principles into practice. And as we do this, look at what he says. Keep putting into practice all that you have uh, learned and received from me, everything you had heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Again, there's a cause and effect. When we do these things a certain way, the way God calls us to, God responds in a certain way. When we do it the culture's way, we only ever get the way the culture sees it. But when we do it God's way, we get God's result. The amplified version adds this. He says um, in verse 9, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in daily life. Not a once in a while. Don't only practice it when it's time to leave to visit those family members or that time when it's, you know, December season and you need to push through. For, don't just do it seasonally. Do it consistently. Make it a way of life. Practice it all the time so that it becomes part of your character. That's how we experience the peace of God. Why? Because true peace is rooted in Jesus. So as we journey with Jesus, we journey in this way of life. Is this helpful so far? So as we close off this morning, the, go the goal is this, because it's not just about finding peace for peace's sake, right? We don't just want to search for peace just because, yeah, like we want to do it because some, there's something of substance. And so the goal is not just to search for peace and kind of have it. The goal is to become makers and cultivators of peace. That when we find this peace that God gives, that we become people who cultivate it everywhere we are. That means that once we've processed this, we've dealt with it, and we've got a sense of peace, and we now live with it, listen, wherever I am, peace will be there, because yeah. I take God with me, yeah. right? Then I'm no longer dictated to by my circumstances, but I have the ability to influence my circumstances. When I'm at that family gathering, if I'm there, hey, I'm the person that is a non-anxious presence, 
It's okay, right? When I'm there, I don't know, maybe you've heard this. I've seen certain people that when they're there, you just know things are going to be okay. It's just like they just have this calmness about them. Like they don't freak out. They don't stress, right? These people, we love them, but also they're very annoying sometimes. Because sometimes you freak out. You're like, can you just match my energy so that I don't feel crazy? And they just like, it's almost like they just go through life floating around. It's like, you know, here's peace for you, peace for you. Everybody gets peace. It's very annoying. But we love these people. So Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, he starts off the Sermon on the Mount by redefining what it means to be blessed. So blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those. He repeats different things. In one of them, he says, blessed, in, in the Amplified, it adds, spiritually calm with life joy in God's favor. So in this context, that's what it means. So blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace. For they will express his character and be called sons of God. Blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace. I don't know if you know this, but scripture gives a distinction between peacemakers and peacekeepers. It's not the same thing. Many of us aim to be peacekeepers, which really is another word for being diplomatic. So what is a peacekeeper? A peacekeeper is simply someone who wants to keep others happy. So maybe you're one of these people that when you go and there's an anxious situation at home and and family is getting tense, you're the peacekeeper, so you just want to make sure everyone's happy at the expense of your own peace. So you're the one who says, you run around, you want to make sure, are you guys okay? You guys are fine, okay? Have you eaten? Okay, great. And you run around, are you guys okay? These people are fighting with those people. I'll keep them in separate parts of the yard and I'll be the person that, you know? And you, at the end of the day, you are, you're wrecked and you're tired and you're anxious and you're not at peace. Why? Because you've just been keeping peace. But peacemaking is something different because peacemaking requires a little bit of confrontation. I don't know if you realize Jesus was a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. He's the one that would confront anything that would rob peace in the kingdom of God. So when he goes into the temple, if he were a peacekeeper, he would go into the temple, see people selling stuff and be like, sorry, 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 guys. Sorry, I don't mean to disturb you, but is it okay if you guys just pack up your tables and just go sell somewhere else just for a little while? Look, listen, I just want these, you know what? You can still sell. You can, look, I don't want to offend you. Look, you can still sell. Just sell on the other side of the temple wall, okay? Like, that's peacekeeping. Like, just let's make sure everyone's happy. Peacemaking is like, hey, foot just <laughs> takes the table. See, did you see how I nearly lost my glasses there? And he just, you know, why? Because for him, it's about confronting the things that are robbing people's true peace. Yeah. So for those of you, the journey towards peace making means that maybe when I finally go home, I know there's going to be tension, but I'm the one that calls both parties together and say, guys, we need to talk about this. We need to resolve this so we can all live peaceably, not just maintaining the status quo, but we need to be the people who confront it and say, listen, it's not okay. It's not okay that everyone is okay with that uncle who says it and we all just kind of turn a blind eye and just like, you know how he is. He'll be fine. He doesn't really mean it. Look, he's not racist. It's just when he's had something to drink, he says something. We all know someone like that. Huh? No, no, that's, that's peacekeeping. Peacemaking is him. And you can't say that around this table. There are kids here. It's confronting what needs to be confronted so that peace can reign in that environment. And so Jesus says, that is what it means to be blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace. The goal is to find peace so that we can cultivate peace. Not find peace so that we can have peace and everyone else can sort themselves out. I'm at the family gathering, everyone's fighting him and I'm fine. I'm in the corner of my camp chair watching it, maybe Instagramming it or live tweeting it as it happens. I'm chill. No, 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 that's not what it means to find peace. Finding peace means I now am a catalyst to bringing peace in my environment, in my workplace, in my family, with my friends or whatever it is. When I'm there, I'm the one who brings peace peace. That's the goal for you and I. And what this is going to require, this is what um, there, are, there are some psychologists, and I, and I learned it from a guy called Peter Cesaro. He uses the word becoming differentiated, right? And it's this concept that we are differentiated because our inner world is completely separate to our outer world, meaning that I can be completely at peace even though there's turmoil around me. I am differentiated. I don't let external things rob me of what God has placed on the inside. I am a non-anxious presence. 
because the peace of God is so entrenched in me that no matter what happens, people can be freaking out, I'm the one who brings calm. The goal is for all of us to become highly differentiated. We aren't easily triggered. We aren't tossed back and forth by situations and circumstance. Every time there's a setback, we're in tears, we need friends, we need counseling. It's just, no, no, no. We're not those people. We know how to handle things. We are grounded. We aren't easily triggered and offended. We are stable and able to hold tensions and tough conversations with confidence without losing a portion of ourselves. Isn't that an amazing thing to work towards? That our families know if, if anything needs to be resolved, let's call that person. They know how to mediate well because they are grounded and they are well differentiated. That's the goal of finding peace. This is why it's so important for all of us to go on this journey. Don't just ignore it. Don't just cut people off. I'm not visiting those family members. I'm not seeing those friends. Don't cut it off. Deal with what needs to be dealt with so we can cultivate health. Amen. Will you help this morning? Yes. Father God, we pray that as we journey towards peace, God, this journey can only happen with you at the center. And so firstly, we need to start by repenting. God, we are so sorry for the times we've run seeking for peace in things that bring more anxiety. Forgive us for the times we thought that peace would be found in another relationship or with another person or in a specific place. Father, forgive us for the times we have been deceived into thinking that peace can be found in anything outside of ourselves. God, may you help us realize that peace is found in you. So for those of us who have run to and fro, for those of us who are exhausted, running after things to be at peace, Holy Spirit, may you lead us to simply running to the feet of God. Father God, we pray that in this moment, even now, I believe that you are speaking to people, drawing them closer to yourself. God, I pray that in this moment, we would recognize what have been the things that we've allowed to lead us away from true peace and sell us a false peace. Father God, I pray that we would start at your feet, communing with you, having the courage to take what is bringing anxiety in our hearts and placing it before you, and then receiving all that you want for us, the love, peace, the joy, the kindness, the patience, the gentleness, the goodness, the self-control, the mercy, and may you embed that into our hearts. I pray for those who have lived with this constant stress, constant anxiety of juggling people's feelings and people's situations and trying to be peacekeepers and just trying to keep everyone happy that they've weared themselves down. I pray, God, that you would give them wisdom. Father God, I pray that you would give them courage. Then rather than trying to be something, that they would simply be content to point people back to you. May they stop trying to be the source of peace for others and may they point people to the source of peace, which is you. Father God, we pray that this season, while for some it may bring so much anxiety, so much stress, so much confusion, I pray that we would Use this time intentionally to the, reflect on the Prince of Peace, Jesus himself, who it was prophesied of that he would bring peace and his peace, his reign would be peaceful. I pray that we would rest in the Savior. In Jesus' name. God, we thank you and we love you and we honor you. In your name we pray. Amen. We trust this message was helpful to you. We'd love for you to stay in touch. So follow us on Instagram at United Church SA or contact us on our WhatsApp number. Be blessed.